Hi, welcome to the Buzz on Bees with the Placentia Library District. Today, your host will be Michelle, the Adult Programming and History Room Librarian, and Victor, the Teen Librarian. So let's get started, and Victor's going to take it away. So we can go ahead and start off with the life cycle of the honeybee. The life cycle consists of three main stages. We have the larva, pupil, and the adult stages. The lifespan of the honeybee depends on various factors. Worker honeybees have a lifespan of only six weeks during the honey production season. Whatever their lifespan, worker bees are usually con confine themselves to one task at a time, working without a pause. Uh, first, we have our worker honeybees that we're going to talk about. And the worker honeybees are the female bees that, hatched for, uh, that are hatched from fertilized eggs. After hatching, the worker bees spend about six days in the larval stage. Uh, what this means is that during the first few days, larvae are mass-fed worker jelly or brood food. This worker jelly is mixed of fluids produced by the glands of the adult worker bees. Larvae are fed between 150 to 800 times for up to three days. After the first three days, the feed process, uh, process slows down. During the larva stage, fat bodies are built up and are able to store lipids, glycogen, amino acids, and mitochondria bodies that are later, later used for the pupal stage. After eight or nine days, the larvae molt. Then they begin to spin a cocoon with silk produced from the thoracic salivary glands. This marks the beginning of the pupal stage. On this slide you can see some bee pupa and if you see the little rice looking uh, things in the hive that is actually an egg. The pupal stage is when most parts of the adult bee form the wings, legs, abdomen, internal organs, and muscles. Pupa will use the stores of fat bodies built up during the larval stage during this period of growth. They remain in this stage for about 20 to 21 days. Once hatched, bees do not leave the cell for three to four hours as they have a soft skin or cuticle, and that takes time to harden. Once their skin is hardened, the bees must feed within a few hours. Without bacteria and proteins that ingesting pollen brings, the development process and lifespan of the bees can be threatened. All young bees spend the first one to three weeks of their lives carrying out functions within the hives. These tasks include feeding and cleaning larvae, cleaning the hive cells, building comb, guarding, patrolling, accepting pollen from foragers, storing, curing, and packing pollen, and much more. After about three weeks, the glands that produce larval food and wax begin to degenerate. The bee moves from the brood nest and begins to learn how to be a forager. Worker bees typically live 15 to 38 summer days and in winter, Changes in the bee anatomy, specifically well-developed hypopharyngeal glands and an increased supply of fat bodies enable worker bees to live 140 to 320 days. So now we can talk about the queen bee. Queen bees and worker bees are both hatched from unfertilized eggs. The only difference between these two bees is their diet. Special cells known as queen cups can be constructed by worker bees in which an ex existing queen bee will lay eggs into. Larvae in, this queen in these queen bee cells are mass fed with the royal diet for the entirety of the larva development. The royal diet contains three stages. In the first stage, a white fluid produced by the mandibular gland is fed to the larva for three days. The secondary, secondary diet involves a half and half mixture of secretions for the, from the mandibular and hypopharyngeal glands. In the final two days of the larva life, honey is added to the queen larva diet. The addition of the honey provides an increased sugar content as well as high levels of a hormone known as juvenile hormone. High levels of this hormone alter the development of the body by inducing the production of hormones and proteins specific to producing the anatomy of a queen bee. When the queen bee first hatches, one of her first priorities upon emerging is to eliminate the presence of other queens. 
This process usually involves the killing of an existing queen or an additional queen larva. Six days after emerging, the new queen will leave the hive on a mating flight on which she will mate with up to 20 drones. The when the queen's sperm sac is full, she will return to the colony. Once having mated, the queen will never leave the colony again, unless in the case of swarming. Three days after mating, the queen will begin to lay up to 1,000 eggs a day for the rest of her life. Queen bees on average have a lifespan of two to five years and can lay around 200,000 eggs a year. Okay, now we're on to the drone bee, and you can see the drone on the uh, right-hand side of your screen, and a worker bee is at the bottom left side of your screen. Drone bees make up about 15% of the colony population. Being large in size, they are distinguishable from the queen by the tapered shape of their abdomen. Drones are the only males in the hive hatching from unfertilized eggs laid in larger cells by the mated queen. Drone larvae are fed a modified version of the worker bees diet that include increased quantities of pollen and honey. New drone bees are fed a combination of pollen and honey and brood food from nurse bees until they are mature enough to feed themselves from the hive honey stores. Adult drones never collect food, secrete wax, or feed the young. They lack a stinger as well as a long tongue suited for nectar collection. A drone's sole purpose is to mate with the new or newly mated queens. They first leave the hive about six days after emerging, flying to areas known as drone congregating areas, only returning to the hive after a failed male mating outing. The few drones that do succeed in mating with a queen die shortly after. Drones typically have a lifespan of eight weeks, although it is relative to when he succeeds in mating with the queen. Not being an essential function of the colony, pressurized situations such as nectar shortage or the onset of fall may lead worker bees to cannibalize or clean out drone broods and or expel drones from the colony. So now we can talk about the unfortunate decline of the honeybee. Scientists know that honeybees are dying from a variety of factors, pesticides, drought, habitat destruction, nutrition deficit, air pollution, global warming, and more. Many of these causes are interrelated the bottom line is that we know that humans are largely responsible for two of the most prominent causes, pesticide and habitat loss. So what can you do to help stop the decline of the honeybee? Well, add bees to your garden. In fact, bees add a lot to all gardens. Your flower and vegetable gardens will benefit from you keeping bees. You will also get the sweet rewards of homegrown honey and beeswax. Bees are known as the nature's best pollinators. Without them, we wouldn't have nearly as many flowers and plants. Bees depend on flowers and plants for nutrition. Nectar is collected for a few reasons. It's a bee's main energy source, as it's full of sugar, which is also used to help make honey in their hive. Pollen is full of fat and protein, which helps feed the hive. When bees collect pollen, they carry it from one flower to another. This cross-pollination is essential for flowers in order to produce more seeds. As bees cross-pollinate, more flowers and plants will grow. A bee gets the nutrients they need, and your garden ends up with more flowers and plants. There are a few ways to bring wild honeybees to your garden. These tips will also help out your beekeeping hive. Growing bee-friendly plants and flowers is a great way to start. Here is a list of flowers that will help with honey production. Rosemary, wild geranium, sunflowers, daisies, coneflowers, snapdragons, poppies, clover, bee balm, oregano, aster, zinnias, marigolds, milkweed, and lavender. Another way to attract bees to your garden is a reliable water source. As with any living creature, bees need to stay hydrated. A bird bath, garden pond, or a water feature will do the trick. Just make sure the bees have somewhere to land. Use a small stone um, in a pond or a flat stone in a bird bath that's above water level. So what bees add to the environment? Like all creatures, bees play an important role in maintaining a balanced and successful ecosystem. The plants that bees pollinate create food and shelter for many other creatures such as birds, squirrels, and other insects. If if honeybees disappear, these plants and animals will so would soon follow. An interesting fact, some scientists estimate 
that one in three bites of food we eat is a result of a hardworking pollinator such as the honeybee. Well, let's talk about why bees matter. First of all, they provide us with a balanced ecosystem. Although they are small and often a noticeable part of nature, honeybees are an essential part of the planet. The plants that bees pollinate create food and shelter for many other creatures such as birds, squirrels, and insects. If honeybees disappeared, these plants and animals would soon follow. Of course, bees also pollinate crops, and farmers rely on bee honeybees to keep their crops thriving throughout spring and summer. Bees and other pollinators are responsible for helping plants spread pollen, reproduce, and continue to grow every year. Crops like apples, melons, berries, and almonds depend on the work of honeybees to produce their food. In fact, some farmers even rent colonies of bees to pollinate their fields every year. Bees also help all plants flourish. They work to pollinate plants that produce many of the seeds, nuts, and fruits that serve as a food source for local wildlife. Additionally, bees' pollination efforts allow flowering plants to flourish, creating a more colorful and gorgeous environment for everyone to enjoy. How to create a sustainable bee environment. Every garden needs pollinators and bees are among the best. Without them, there would be a limited amount of flowers and even fewer fruits and vegetables. Bees are basically looking for two things when they visit your plants, nectar and pollen. Nectar is loaded with sugars and it's the bee's main source of energy, and pollen provides a balanced diet of proteins and fats. When you're planting, look to see if your plants are hybridized. Many of the popular varieties are hybridized for features that are valued by the gardener, like disease resistant, flower size and color, and bigger and longer blooms. Unfortunately, the hybridization has reduced the production of nectar and pollens and sometimes leaves the resulting plant completely sterile and useless to bees and other pollin pollinators. So what can you do to attract more bees to your garden? Let's uh, talk about some ways. First of all, don't use pesticides. Most pesticides are not selective. You are killing off the beneficial bugs along with the pests. If you must use a pesticide, start with the least toxic one and follow the label instructions to the letter. Try and use local and native plants whenever possible. Research suggests native plants are four times more attractive to native bees than exotic flowers. They are also usually well adapted to your growing conditions and can thrive with minimum attention. In gardens, heirloom varieties of herbs and perennials can also provide good foraging. You can also choose several colors of flowers. Bees have good color vision to help them find flowers and the nectar and pollen they offer. Flower colors that particularly attract bees are purple, blue, violet, white, and yellow. Try and plant your flowers in clumps. Flowers clustered into clumps of one species will attract more pollinators than individual plants scattered through the habitat patch. Where space allows, make the clumps of four feet or more in diameter. You also want to include flowers of different shapes because there are more than 4,000 different species of bees in North America and they are all different sizes, have different tongue lengths and will feed on different shaped flowers. So by providing a range of flower shapes means more bees can benefit. You also want to have a diversity of plants flowering all season. Many bee species are generalists, feeding on a range of plants through their life cycle. By having several plant species flowering at once and a sequence of plants flowering through spring, summer, and fall, you can support a range of bee species that fly at different times of the seasons. And of course, plant where bees will visit. Bees favor sunny spots over shade and need some shelter from strong winds. All right, and now we can start with the fun part. We can get ready to taste our honey samples that we have. So for the honey samples, if you notice, there are different colors. The darker the color, the stronger the flavor will be. So our first honey sample that we have is sample A. That'll be the clover honey. Uh, the clover honey has a pleasing, mild taste. Clover contributes to more honey production in the United States than any other group of plants. The clover in the clover honey includes white Dutch clover, white blo blossom clover, and yellow blossom clover. 
Clover honey has a sweet flowery flavor and a mild and a pleasing mild taste. Our second honey that we have is honey bee, and that's going to be raw honey. The raw honey tends to have more complex flavors than the pasteurized honey. Uh, different varieties taste like the nectar that the bee feasted on before producing the honey, with some light and sweet and others dark and robust. So now we have our third honey sample that's going to be sample C and that's wildflower honey. Wildflower honey is light and fruity yet richly flavored at the same time. The specific wildflowers from which the bees got their nectar to make the honey will turn the flavors more delicate or intense. Fun bee fact. It takes a worker bee about 12 hours to secrete eight wax scales. Around 1,000 scales must be created to make a single gram of wax. Now that's what I call one busy bee. Planting your kit. So to create your own mini bee garden, the first thing you'll do is distribute the dirt into a biodegradable seed starter pot. And then you're going to follow the directions on the back of your seed packet to plant your seeds in the pot. After that, you can enjoy, watch your flowers grow, and hopefully it will attract bees to your garden. Thank you so much for joining Victor and myself today. We can't wait to see you at the library. Please check your email for a link to our survey. Your opinion matters to us. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. I think it...